Father God, we are just um, we are just so thankful for the opportunity to be together as women and God, um, with masks or without masks, God, we are so happy to be in the presence of each other and to be able to study your word and learn from you, God, to just, as you have worked in our lives and done things in our lives that really um, we know only you could do, God, um, I just thank you for you're ministering in our lives and changing us and shaping us and God I thank you for just this whole chapter that we are reading that God really should help us in this sanctification process that we're going through and um, God we just love you and we just thank you for this time in Jesus name amen so one of my problems is I got caught on a rabbit trail preparing for the lesson. Um, and I'm, I'm going to share just a little bit what I got caught on. And um, hopefully um, you'll enjoy it. And I'm going to tell you right up front that something really weird happened in this week's lesson that has never happened before to me. So I use an old edition of the book. Um, I stay with wherever I did my original work and I keep that as my foundation and then I add to it. So usually, and, and I did it this time as well, I would get a new book at the beginning and I'll kind of look at it and just make sure everything's the same. Well, I didn't catch it that they asked a question in my homework that, that is not asked in your homework. So there is, y'all understand what I mean? Because you have a newer edition. They took the question out, which is very funny because before I even knew that they were going to do that, I wrote on the top of the slide, mad. Because I was mad that they had asked the question. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, that literally I thought that basically by asking that one question and having you look up two verses that they really opened up a whole can of worms that detract from the message. Mm -hmm. That it was just one thing that we could get caught on a rabbit trail that's not going to help you live a sanctified life. And so that slide says at the top, when did Christ die? And you'll find it. Um, it's probably on what the second or third page slide eight so if you could put an X through it and you can look up those verses on your own time and send me an email if you want <laughs> or we'll talk about it sometime when we have time but it's when Christ died and you has you're looking up two passages and I did forget to put the second one down let me tell you what it is it is 1 Peter. All right, so you see there, Revelation 13, 8. The second one is 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. So I'm glad that Precept continues to edit their work. And it probably came from leaders really probably reaching out to the ministry and saying, hey, listen, this is really a little rabbit trail for no reason in the middle of this lesson. And there's really not time to talk about it. So just let that be. Um, and if you're one of those that has a hard time letting anything be. <laughs> I know, Elisma. You and I can go to lunch or go to coffee. It is a fabulous trip. And it will blow your mind. But read it on your own time. Okay? Not during my lesson today. Consider that extra homework for this week. Extra credit. That's right. So, what we are going to talk about this week is this whole idea of being identified with Christ and what difference that makes in our lives and the huge difference that it should make in our lives. And one of the words that she had you color um, this week is the word no. 
and I wanted to talk about that word a little bit because no is one of those words. Um, I think she had you look that up maybe day two or three in your homework. And she just had you not look up the word, but just pick out everything that Paul says he wants us to know. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this word, no, that Paul uses there. So the very first slide, you'll see that, that the word is oida. And it's knowledge as a result of relationship. You could write next to that that it's intuitive knowledge. It's just things we know in our guts. It's things that we know because we're in relationship with God. And it's not necessary, necessarily progressive knowledge. <laughs> and so what I want us to just really get, and this is why this is important, is that this knowledge is knowledge that you get when you enter into a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes these things known to you. Epinosis comes from an experiential, as you experience God, you grow in your knowledge of him. Correct? We would all agree with that. But these truths, honestly, are those that only a spiritual man can understand. And I, I just wanted to read for you really fast a passage of scripture. And by the way, it's a really fun word. Jesus uses this word all the time. <laughs> where he will even be saying in one um, passage of scripture, like the one verse, he'll use the word oida, which is this kind of inherent um, intuitive knowledge, and he'll use the word gnosis, which is more just like things that you've learned. Do y'all know the difference, right? Mm -hmm. There's just things we know in our guts. This is more gut knowledge where your gnosis would be more head knowledge, things that you've learned. And why that's important is in 1 Corinthians, I just want to read this to you, is that honestly, some of the things that we list here and that we're going to talk about today is just really things that we have to accept in our guts. It's things we have to just know intuitively. And so... When Paul is talking about wisdom and, and what we can know, I'm just going to pick up in verse 11. So sorry. 1 Corinthians 2, 11. Thank you, Jane. And Paul says here to the church at Corinth, he says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? Meaning that we know our, really we know our own thoughts, right? Like, we know what we think. And what he is saying it here is he's going to turn it and he's going to say, who better to know the thoughts of God than God himself? And he's literally deposited God and that ability to know things into our lives through the Holy Spirit. And he says, so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, and that we would impart in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, inter interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. I love that, that it says that we have this Holy Spirit that we might understand things freely given to us by God. And if you wanted to write something above this chapter 6, is that these are things freely given to us by God. This ability to be able to live a sanctified life, a sanctified walk, is given to us freely by God at the point of our salvation. And he says, 
He goes on to say, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. We have the understanding of Christ. And I think one of the things is that when you get frustrated with not being able to understand something, don't give up. You have the Holy Spirit living in you that wants to work through your heart, your brain. And you know what I have found is I have found some people who may have a low IQ, but they can understand the mysteries of God more than somebody who may be a chemist or a physicist. And so it really is the work of God in our lives that we can even know these truths about him. So that was my little rabbit trail that I got caught on yesterday morning. And it's, it's interesting that when we look at these things that he wants us to know, all of these things, again, are things freely given to us by God to help us in our walk. And those things are that we have been baptized into his death. And this is going back to the slide. These are all pulled directly out of chapter 6. And in fact, if, if you colored it, I colored mine yellow. All I'm doing is reading each place that that was colored in your homework. So we are baptized into his death. And that sounds super weird, right? And um, if, but I hope by the time you leave today, you'll be able to really explain that. Like really explain it to yourself. And I would practice that, by the way. Like go home if you're married and try to explain to your husband. Like, I learned this truth today and let me explain it to you because it's a really good way or teach one of your kids or you know, have that discussion with somebody because then you really learn what you've, what you've kept um, by talking it back out. And you may be like, wait a minute, I'm not explaining it right. Let me go back and study it and then re-explain it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's a good way for you to filter back out. Um, and really, those are the things that in the heat of the moment, those things that are really now our truths, they will affect our lives. God will bring them to you at the right moments, and that's how we really affect life change. Here's something else that Paul wants us to know that we know, that we should just know intuitively, is that our old self was crucified with him and that we're no longer slaves of sin. Man, if we get that thought, it would completely change how we live our lives to realize that we're no longer a slave to sin but a slave to God if the church universal really got a hold of that truth that they're no longer under this bondage but they're now a bond servant of Christ and that Christ is never to die again death is no longer master over him well why that's important is that death no longer will be master over you and the relationship between sin and death, that sin will no longer be master over you. Now, you may listen to sin, and you may commit sins, but truly, sin has lost its grip on you. Sin has lost it, its grip on you. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes, yes. That's verse 9 that I just read. So the first one was verse 3. The second one was verse 6. And the second one was verse 9. Third one it's verse 9. And then um, the next one is, where's the next no? Somebody tell me. 16. Thank you. 16. Yep, there it is. 
Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one that you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? And you may say, okay, well, it says it right there that either I can present myself to sin or I can present myself to God. Now, yes, that is true, but I want you to go back to the context of this chapter. Go back to chapter, verse 1 of chapter 6. What is the context um, of it? 1 and 2. Somebody tell me. Absolutely. It is, Anita, you're exactly correct that the presupposition of this chapter is that we have already died to sin. Okay? So this isn't whether you're going to die to sin or not. This chapter is in the sanctification part of Romans. Remember, your need for salvation, the... What's that word that goes with it? Where he explains the salvation. Sanctification? Uh, anyhow. And then this next one is the life of salvation. This is after you've already been justified. So you, this is not whether you're going to be a slave to sin. Paul's explaining to you why we don't have to sin anymore because you're no longer a slave to sin. But he is assuming that you've already died to sin. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that is the context of which this is written in. It's written within Paul explaining how we don't have to sin anymore. And we don't have to sin anymore because we don't have to listen to sin. It doesn't have master over our lives anymore. And so super, super important how we look at this chapter. The second word that is one of my favorite words is logizomai. Now, I'm going to show you logizomai two different places in Romans, and you're going to be kind of amazed by how differently it's translated. So go back into, I really need to fix these sheets so they actually stay in the book instead of all being, they're all ripped out. Okay, go back to chapter 4, verse 4 of Romans, obviously. And so I'm going to use a different word for the word logizomai. I'm going to use, because I think probably if I was to translate it, um, I would maybe use the word calculate. Okay? And I'll show you because the way the word is used in both places makes sense. And it's credited in our version, right? Correct. <laughs> And so look at verse 3. It says credited in yours, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says reckon still in mine. Mm -hmm. All of those are, every time you see the word credited or reckoned, the word is logizomai. Mm -hmm. And I think probably if I was to come up with a really good like substitute word that you'll see will make sense in the next place we look at it, I would say calculate. So let me just read it that way. It says, for what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God and it was calculated to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works his wage, it's not calculated as a favor, but what is due. By the way, this fits so well into chapter six because he ends chapter six talking about the same thing that when Remember, no matter what field you're working in, you have a benefit and you have a wage. Over here, the wage is death, right? The benefit is shame. Over here, the wage is eternal life. The benefit is sanctification. And so he says, 
Um, now, to one who works his wage, it's not credited or not calculated as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited or calculated as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness or credits righteousness or calculates righteousness apart from works. So in, in the same way, that every time you see that word, that word is logizbi. So turn over now to chapter 6. Now, we talked about that a million times already. That is, we're standing in that courtroom and God is justifying us. He justifies us because he took what was in our account and he credited it to Christ. Correct? Right? And what was that? Sin. And he took the righteousness of Christ and he credited it to our account. So that when we walk out, we now are walking out with our spiritual bank account full of Christ. Now look at the next place that it's used is in verse 11. And you may be like, wow, that's translated so differently. It says, even so, consider yourselves. That word consider is logizomai. Same exact word. Now, <clears throat> when we think of the word consider, we think of it as a very light thought, an easy thought, a not focused thought. Like, I would say, uh, I'm going to consider what I'll have for dinner tonight. I may consider what I'm going to wear tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. But I would not use this word on, I'm going to consider who I'm going to marry or be the big decisions, right? We use a different English word for it. And so I want you to see this, that, and this is the reason why I say all this, is it says, even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, when we read that, it's like, yes, I know, that's what I should consider. It's what I should think about. But so much more than that. It literally means to calculate it in our minds. It literally means to credit it into our lives, to think deeply about, to have this be life-changing for us. And that logizomai carries this weight of a word. Um, I love the definition I put on my sheet here for you, is to occupy oneself with reasoning. What do you occupy yourself with the reasoning of, right? Like, right now, I'm occupying myself, to be honest, with wedding venues. <laughs> <laughs> this is what occupies, right, Molly? <laughs> Molly's getting married as well, so this is our favorite conversation to have. <laughs> I literally know of every single wedding venue that is within an hour and a half from our house. Just ask me. If anybody needs to get married in your family anytime soon, I have occupied myself with this thought. And we have narrowed it down to four, and we're going to look at them Monday when Savannah comes into town. And then I will probably start occupying myself with something else, right? <laughs> Do y'all know what I mean? Yes. We focus our thinking, our time, we occupy ourselves with thoughts. And what are we, what does Paul tell us that we should occupy ourselves with the reasoning, thinking through it, that we are dead to sin, but alive to God? I mean, that, that completely changes that verse for me um, and makes it where, wow, I need to cons just constantly be occupying my thoughts with, I am alive to God. I now work for a new master who, um, and David and I were talking about this because <clears throat> we were talking about those fields and we we're talking, I think he's going to actually preach on the very next slide um, this Sunday. I don't know how he got the, to this word already so quickly. 
But I said, how are you at that word already? I'm at this word. I've been at this since January. And, um, but I think he's going to talk about this word. So that will be super fun to you. Is The next word is this present or yield. And it means to stand before. So you think about if you got the invitation to present yourself to Queen Elizabeth, right? That's the kind of present yourself I want you to think about. And to offer oneself, to yield oneself to. And these are all the things that I've listed there, all the things that we are to yield ourselves, that we're not to go on presenting the members of our body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. We're to present ourselves to God as those alive from the dead and our members as instruments of righteousness to God. I didn't plan on sharing this, but I, I am going to share this. I didn't plan on it. I'm sorry, Kate. But, you know, one of the things Kate and I were talking about is um, my in-laws, the Williams, that will be my in-laws when Savannah and Luke get married. We were driving around in the car, and she, I mentioned um, the Robinsons because of the neighborhood we drove by, and she said, oh, yes, both of our houses are were built by them and and um, she said yeah the only Bible that Jeff has is was given to him by GW Robinson that many years ago and um, and I, I started thinking about really the consequences of that that these are people I'm going to share my grandchildren with and that someday a Bible that GW gave Jeff Williams may be passed on to one of my grandsons. It's kind of an amazing thought, isn't it? That who would even know that our lives would intertwine like that? And the long heritage of doing the right thing. Let's say they handled business really poorly and they cheated the Williams. How much different do you think that would affect how they even approach Christianity? I'm going to hand you a Bible, but I'm going to be a dirty, rotten scoundrel to you. I say that to say that, ladies, we have that opportunity every single day. How we treat people in the grocery store, how we do our business if you work, how you treat your neighbors for Pete's sake. You have the choice of either being an instrument of righteousness or an instrument of unrighteousness. And you may say, well, I'm neither one. No, 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 no. You are one or the other. What's being played through you is that which will draw people to Christ or what's being played through you will be what will push people away from Christ. So I don't bring that up to toot their horn. Kate will probably be mad at me for that. But just the heritage of what he just does, how that will someday even impact. And you know what? Jeff actually picks that Bible up and reads it. And how that will impact even my grandchildren one day. Super cool. How the heritage of just what you do on a daily basis, how it is impacting people that you have no idea you've impacted the life of. You will not know at all that that, that had any ramifications. Super amazing. Somebody have something? I heard a, you want to say something? Okay. So you're probably knowing we're in trouble, right? That I've already not even gotten to your homework yet. But I, I just think these words are so important that all of these things that we yield ourselves to, that sin will, sin will not be the master over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. When you present yourself, and by the way, these are all straight out of the scripture, just in order. So, and, and I, what I did, same thing you could have done, is I colored the word present and I listed every time that word is used. And by the way, that's why you do that. 
you, you do that to say, well, these are the things God wants me to yield myself to. He wants me to yield ourselves to someone as a slave for obedience. He does not want us to yield ourselves to sin. You are, the, this is the reality, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. Right? Mm -hmm. You work for someone. Well, we work for a lot of people sometimes, right? Um, who we yield ourselves to, who we submit ourselves to and surrender ourselves to. In effect, we let them have some master over us. And you may not like that idea. That's how you live with somebody, right? Even your friends can occupy your thoughts, they can, you can change how you spend your time. Y'all get what I mean? And this is the choice that we have and how we live. That are we gonna present, are we gonna yield ourselves to sin or are we gonna yield ourselves to righteousness? And he says, for just as you present your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. And, um, and let's talk about this for just a minute. What are the members? Mind, Mind. Mind. heart, right? It's not just our hands, our eyes, our ears. It's not just what you see, which that's super important. It's not just what you hear. It really is our hearts and our minds and our attitudes and everything that makes us up are the members of our body. Any questions or comments on that? Yes. Because I don't want you to be thinking in your mind that, well, this isn't me. This wasn't given to me. Because the fact of it is, is that if you have been justified by your faith, everything in chapter 6 is your reality. Whether you live like that or not. And by the way, all kinds of people live in an altered reality. <laughs> all of us do right I was talking to a friend um, last night and we were saying you know does any of y'all and I think this is a personality thing every once in a while kind of get in a funk where you just kind of get down a rabbit hole and everything feels discouraging wonder if anybody really loves you you really don't like who you are right and you kind of get now some of you have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> because we went to lunch with three I went to lunch with two ladies one of them totally could relate the other one looked at both of us like we were nuts <laughs> like you all need counseling and we just we talked about it that you just get in that like hole where you just and you get all thinking I know that I can literally alter my reality mm -hmm. I can convince myself that things are true and it will completely alter how I live my life how I respond to others the the bad feelings and thoughts that I can put on people and so as this girl and I were talking about it yesterday, um, we said, you know, I don't know, because I think this is, I don't know, Linda, you could probably tell me this, that maybe some of this is a little bit of a personality thing, and that 
what my goal is, is I don't know if it'll ever be possible to not like flip down into that rabbit hole, but my goal is to have every time spend less time there. Like shorten that window. Because I don't know about you all, some of you get in no funk. You are just emotionally very level and you know, everything's great all the time. Yes, Annie. Um, so Jim Wilder talks about this homeostasis place of joy, which is the highest, the high energy place of shalom. Mm -hmm. And God means for us to live in shalom all the time. Right. But if we're not familiar with that from our mothers, if our mothers didn't live from a place of joy, you don't get it communicated to your eyes. Mm -hmm. So you literally do not know how to attach. So that's an attachment wound. And the same thing happens with God. You literally carry that forward. So if you feel bad or kind of a little crummy about yourself, and you lived in that for tons of years, and it's been so much formation to you, snapping out of that now that you know who God is right. is a big leap. Yeah. So yeah. being around other people. And my whole point of bringing that up is that we can alter our reality. We can say, these things are true, God, and I'm going to live like them. There is, like, this ability to be able to, because I, I see the negative and then I see the positive in my life, and I know that I can literally change. Yes? Just two quick points. Yes. There's a contemporary Christian song out now. I don't remember who sings it. It's called I Know You Better. Mm. And it's really comforting because he's, oh, he's doing what Paul is saying. I see you better. I, I know you better than, than you know. Wow, then and you I'm, even know yourself. I'm raising, mm. I'm going to live in that for mm. you. Mm. So that's comforting. And the, kind of what Annie was saying about how attached we can become to things. I was speaking to my husband this week, and he, and maybe it's not just within women, but it's clearly like a, a, a male-female thing. He said that he, in his humble opinion, women attach, like can't detach, mm. like they can calm things. Mm -hmm. and if there's an injustice here or a wrong here, it's mm -hmm. gone. But for for me, when something goes wrong, then I see like the wrong in everything and attach mm -hmm. it to this. And he said, you have to compartmentalize. That yeah. has absolutely nothing to do with this thing right. that you're dealing with right now. That is that. They, men definitely have the way of compartmentalizing things. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. And, um, yeah, so I say all that to say that Paul wants us to understand what our reality is. He wants us to sit there and logismize it, calculate it, occupy yourself with the reasoning of this is who I am in Christ. And so let's move on. I'm going to um, skip the next slide. Um, and just go to this, well, I'll just make mention of this, that I want you to remember that Paul answers three questions in this chapter. The first one, and this is really just because I want it to be clear that we're in context here. How shall we continue in sin so that grace might increase? So the question is that continuing in sin, and does anybody remember what I told you about that word continue? Yes, exactly. It's a habitual residence kind of word. It's that we're going to really live in it, right? Shall we live in sin? He says, may it never be. The question, how shall we die to sin? How shall we now live in it? How shall it be this regular thing in our lives that we're living in? And how do you, do you not know? Do you not, Oida, that we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? And I want to look at that now. I, I want to look at that word, baptized into Christ Jesus. How fun of a word is that to get in your mind, right? You look that up on your word study, right? You had it. And you look this up in your word study and tell me what the word baptismo, baptizo, I say it with an M, there is no M in there, um, means. What does that word mean? 
submerge. Dip, submerge. To submerge. dip. Immerse. 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 I love the word saturate. And I also love the word overwhelm. So I want you just to think with me about a piece of cloth. If I'm to have purple dye, and this is the word, you all. When Paul's using baptized, he is not thinking of a Southern Baptist church and a water baptism <laughs> that we baptize people in, right? This is not his thought. He is using a common Greek word that would be used. That if I brought a white piece of cloth, there were people, do you remember, by the way, this is just a side little note, that one of the things, um, do you remember Lydia in Philippi? She was a wealthy woman, why? She's, right, and here's the thing, Elisma said it right, she sold purple is what she sold. You would bring her a piece of cloth and she would baptize it. She would put it in water and it would be immersed. It would be dipped. It would be overwhelmed with that purple dye, right? And when you would pull it out, it would be completely identified with that which it was dipped. That is such a great definition as we look at when he says we've been baptized with Christ, that we have been saturated in him. And you may be like, oh, well, that didn't happen to me. Well, then we need to go back to justification because Paul is saying that this is what did happen to you. This is the reality whether you realize it or not, that you were saturated, you were overwhelmed by the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And that which you've been baptized in, that which you've been dipped in, has changed your identity. You now have a new identity that you cannot go back to being white cloth anymore. You are purple, right? I have another example on there that would be used. This is a, it's a, a food word even. They would take a cucumber, we still do it today, right? In fact, on Wednesday nights, um, the best little pickle maker is in that class. <laughs> Emma makes the most delicious pickles. And what's the process of pickling something? You take one thing, you overwhelm it, you saturate it in something, and it comes out something completely different. And you can't go back, right? You can't go back to making a cucumber out of a pickle. There's no going back. Once it's been baptized, once it's been saturated, overwhelmed, it has changed its identity. Let that sit on you for a minute. Once you've been baptized into Christ, it has changed your identity. You come out a pickle. Okay? You went in a cucumber, you come out a pickle. And here's the thing. That does not happen at water baptism time. That happens at the point of salvation. And again, you may be like, oh, I don't think that happened to me. Go back to the reality thing whether you realize it or not, at the point of salvation. And if you really think that didn't happen to you, then let's go back and look at justification again and just make sure that we have it all, that you truly accepted Christ, you truly surrendered, you truly put your faith and trust in him. You can't make a cucumber feel like a pickle. You cannot make a cucumber feel like a pickle. No, you cannot. And I know that is so, like, silly, but I'm telling you, like, those word pictures help me so much that when I have the opportunity to sin, when I, like, think in your brain, I'm a pickle, not a cucumber. My identity has been changed. I need to act like a pickle now, right? We don't put pickles in salads. They have two different purposes once you've changed their identity even. I mean, it's a silly illustration, but it's so good when you think of just the practicality of it. And also, Ms. Leno, um, like the grape 
Rolligan, like uh, Spurgeon, he made this very awesome illustration. Mm. It was basically, so we are the sheep, and we have the pigs. If we are sheep, then we will fall. We may fall in mud, but we will roll around in the mud. Mm. So how a pig enjoys to roll around in the mud. As sheep, once we fall in the mud, we will feel dirty, we will feel disgusting, mm. and we will get out. But what does the pig do? It keeps rolling around the mud, it parties mm. part in the mud, screws in the mud. So that's how we know the difference. We are sheep, we are not pigs. I love that. So such a great illustration, Susan. And I'm going to restate it because this is what some of my Zoom critiques have been, and they're valid, is that they don't get to hear everything. So other than us passing a microphone, which would make you not say a word, <laughs> there's no solution to that. So um, Susan shared, and it's so true, that Spurgeon, um, how he compares it is that we're either a pig or a sheep. And that pigs play in mud, they love the mud. And, and um, one of my friends has a pig, it's so adorable. And yes, it loves to play in the mud and it's the cutest little pig, but we're sheep. And that sheep don't stay down in the mud. They don't, you know, you don't ever see sheep rolling around in the mud. That we're literally, our identity is completely changed in that new creation. And one other thing that made me think of that is that there's this great book about Jesus being our good shepherd and how he takes care of us. And do you know what's true? is that sheep hate to be on the ground. And you know why? They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable and they often can't get back up. Right. You know, they're sort of like, you know, help me, I've fallen and I can't get up, right? <laughs> so you, what does the shepherd have to do? The shepherd has to go over there and pick the sheep up. So a sheep cannot stand to be on the ground getting all dirty because they feel vulnerable on the ground and they have to have the shepherd come over to right them and to help them. That's good, really good. Yes. I love that analogy you made of bringing the cloth because in the end when you get that gift, I would bring a different kind of dress than you might bring. Mm. So it's still us, like we get to keep our personality, oh, yeah. what we love, what we like, our gifting, but we're in Christ. That's a great, so like some of us may bring a tunic, some of us may bring a cocktail dress. You know, we're all bringing something different to be dipped. I love that. And you don't, you don't lose all of your identity when you identify yourself with Christ. And, and here's the beautiful thing is that he was, he completely identified himself with us so that we can even do that. He took on sin. He became sin for us, that which he did not deserve. He completely took on our identity. So let's just walk through some of those verses real quick. And, um, and they're so good because the question is, and the question is for us, how do we not live in sin? Is it, isn't that the question of sanctification? Yeah. How do we not live in sin? How do we get ourselves in a position and in a place where we do sin? We have sin in our lives, but it's quickly dealt with. It, we're not living in it. We're not dwelling in it. It's not the practice of our lives. How do we do that? And by the way, you may be like, well, I figured this all out, and there's just nothing I struggle with at all. Praise Jesus for you. I love that. That is not the reality always of my life. And so let's look at what he says. He says, if we've become, oh, let's go back. Verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3. Thank you for always reminding me that you can't read my mind and know where I want you to go. Verse 3, chapter 6, or do you not know? Like, now, what did I say to you about that word no? This is something we should know. It should be intuitive. This is not something progressive. We need to know this. 
It needs to be our oida. It needs to be our knowledge that, and, and it's what the Holy Spirit can teach us. And, or do you not know that all who have been saturated or dipped or immersed into Christ Jesus have been immersed, baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Now, you may be like, well, that sounds really strange. Why would I, how have I been buried with Jesus through baptism into death? Will you answer that for me? How have you? What have you died? What has died? Sin, Sin our self, right? That is what we have died to. And we have died to those things in order that as, and by the way, that's a one-time event in your life. Mm -hmm. Now you continue to deal with sin, just like once you've transferred over to this new farm that you're working at, right? You cross that road, and that crossing of the road, if you weren't here last week, this makes no sense to you, I'm so sorry. But that crossing of the road is the baptism. It is you being in Christ. You're over here now. This was your reality. This is your reality now. It doesn't mean that people can't call over from this side, right? And try to boss you around or make fun of you that you're working different or doing things differently over here now, right? We talked about this that we at the end of chapter 6, Paul kind of compares it that basically – of you as an employee you're, you're working for one or the other and then david and i were talking about this yesterday that you don't even work as a slave you work as a son such a sweet um, thought there but um it doesn't mean that your old boss may not be calling over to you trying to tell you how to do things or that you may think back right just like the israelites did you may think back and say, ooh, I like some things back in Israel. I mean, in Egypt. I like things back there. Sometimes you can think back to your old employer and think, ooh, I like some things, and maybe I'll do some things like that. The, the, the reality of it is that this is now your new place, though, and you don't have to live in those thoughts. You don't have to listen. You don't have to have that continual sin in your lives. Now, do I believe that at any point we will be completely removed from any kind of presence of sin? No, no not till we are glorified with Jesus forever. But it's that process of while we're working in the fields that we need to understand. Go to the very last page in your homework. And if you didn't do all of your homework, you may not have even gotten to this. I'm sorry for the pink dye stain there. Did anybody have time to get to this chart in their homework? I'm going to go ahead and take a minute and go over this little chart. Zoom people, do you see this chart? Did you have it? What page is that on? 45. 45 in your homework is the big one. This is a good one. In fact, this is a good one to be able to sit down and even explain to somebody. And this is wrapping up really a couple weeks homework that we talked about that at creation, here you are, right? You're the little stick figure, and this is God. Kind of looks like you're dancing, right? You're in fellowship. You're joined hands, you're in fellowship. And in particular, the swirly is the Holy Spirit, peace of God. You'll see that in a minute. So then you have the fall occurs, right? And you have that the serpent comes, he tempts Adam and Eve, 
and Adam and Eve fall, and the result of that is that now there is separation between Adam, the little stick guy, man, that's us, and God. And you see there that the wages of that life is death. Negative righteousness. I love that. And the way to life over there would be with God. But there is a, there is a, what would you call that word? A gulf that you have to cross back over. And then I love the next slide or the next box is it's reconciliation affected. And you see Jesus there on the cross. And what do you see there now? The Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And you see man. And that is the point of the crucifixion. And then, which in a human timeline. But in the mind of God, that happened before the foundation of the earth. See the slide that I was mad about. Reconciliation accepted. So here we are. This is right here. This is the point of standing in that courtroom, right? This is the point of justification. We repent. We accept Jesus by faith. And we now, we are justified by faith. We have peace with God. The two become one. So that is the baptism right there. You could write baptized right there. The two become one. And now, don't you love this? Is here we are again in fellowship with God. But what do you notice? Now we actually have the Holy Spirit living in us. So the Holy Spirit kind of wraps that whole relationship up. And I love to, are we having an issue? Okay. And then we have at the bottom is a great little box too. I just wanna put this before you. And it talks about the threefold realities of our salvation. That in the past tense, we have been saved. That's the justification word. It is when we are standing in that courtroom, we have been justified, right? And what does that word mean? That's exactly right. We have, God does not see our sin. He sees Christ when he looks at us, right? That justification happens at one point of time. And... Um, where you are freed from the penalty. And here's the miracle of it. Well, there's many miracles of it, but this is one aspect of the miracle, is that at that point of justification, it's not just for your past sins, but it's for your future sins as well. Ongoing. All of the penalty for your sin is dealt with at that point of justification. Now, I, that may do like this right like how can God forgive me of things that I haven't even done yet and again it's one of the things we're going to have to do is accept in our minds that God does not deal with time the way that we do he does not see me in this linear way so that when he justified me April 10th 1987 was my point of salvation. He justified me for I, Jesus took the penalty of all the sin that I would commit. And then the next part of it is the present tense. I am being saved. On a daily basis, there is the work of Christ in my life, and that's called sanctification. And do you know what Jesus broke? at the point of salvation. What did he break? It's in that column. The power of sin. Now that's theology that you hear differently in a lot of places. 
right? That sin still has this incredible grip and power over us that, you know, we were talking about this even last night. I stayed late and talked to somebody and um, if, if you like ponder, um, if or you read magazines on psychology or whatever, one of the big thoughts is there's this duality of man and there's kind of a good side and a bad side. And if you're not careful, Christians believe this too. And that the good side and the bad side are in a war with each other. And it just depends on who wins that day. That is not our theology. Right. It makes it all up to us whether we're going to listen to the good angel or the bad angel. That's called the duality of man. That is not what we believe. We believe that you are a new creation. You're not half a sheep, half a pig. <laughs> and you just decide that day what you're gonna act like. We believe there is a change in your life that you become a new creation. Now, are you still going to struggle with sin? And this is what messes us up. Absolutely, because guess what? Sin is still on this planet. You still have not been removed from what? The presence of sin, right? We're still living in it, but praise Jesus, one day we will. That's called our glorification. So you have sanctification, I'm sorry, justification, sanctification, glorification. I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. Our salvation is threefold, three kind of like pieces of it that are super important. And a lot of times, isn't this so true? A lot of times you will find churches, people that only focus on one piece of that. Like, have you ever like just been exposed to someone that all they care about is getting to heaven one day? Now, let me keep explaining that how they live today doesn't really matter. Like, I just hope Jesus comes back. But I'm gonna be grumpy and mean to my neighbors and have a bad attitude and sin against everybody I can today. Because Jesus is gonna come back and rescue me. What is that person focused on? I will be saved, right? They're so focused on that that they're missing, I am being saved. There is a process going on in my life where I am being saved. Or they get caught up in the first one. So um, balance it. Your salvation it has three beautiful parts to it. And they're all a gift. It is all a total gift of God's grace and not from anything that we do. That he does that work in our lives. Yes, Annie? conversation with somebody and and they said you know what do you think about the saying you know I am a sinner you know I'm the chief sinner among men and you hear that a lot and I know the heart intent of that is the heart intent of that is they want to level the playing field with who they're talking to they want that person to be like yes I've done really bad things too right but that's really only half the gospel Half the gospel is that I was a dirty, filthy, rotten sinner. But if I leave it at that, then I, I cut, the, cut the head off the gospel. The truth is, is that we are sinners. We are sinners. But we are saved by grace. And you cannot leave that next part off or it's a half truth. It's not the full truth. Does that make sense? And I think some people get stuck in that, well, I'm just a sinner. It's just who I am. So, bye, Winona.
No, honey, you're good. Glad you came. And yes. Yeah. popped up into my head because you know that's the way I think but I would kind of um, think of it and, and they all break down theology wise because how do you describe God and describe his work and word pictures but you know within that field there are definitely people who are committed to the good of the farm that are committed to the kingdom committed to being in fellowship with their father and then there are deadbeats that are not exactly doing what they should be doing and that are not pulling their load who are not in and and you know what if, if they know it usually and they've decided that it's worth it they for the most part they have just said you know what this like you said I've decided that this is how I'm going to live right now. But I, I do believe it's that whole idea of um, the easy believism and all of that. I believe that um, his children come back to him. That's what I believe. Well, I don't think the Holy Spirit allows you to rest until you get that light. Now, see, some of you are going to get that light. Some of you have prodigal children. I have kids who are not living how they should be living as well. And what you want me to do is you want me to give a timetable, right? <laughs> They'll come back within 10 years. If they don't, they're not a Christian, right? I can't do that. You, that's, you're judging them, and you can't do that. According to 1 Corinthians, I can not know the heart of man. My job is to keep explaining that reality to them is that there are two realities in life and that that sin that has so much power over their lives, they can kick it to the curb. It's all about identity because he's still going to those deadbeats and saying, you are my son. Yeah. He's still saying that, sowing that identity and if the enemy can get us deceived about it, it's all about deception. He has no power anymore except deception. Yeah. And once, you know, and here's the thing is that um, once you, especially when you're a parent, you can understand how you can really think not great things about your kids <laughs> and still love them desperately. And until you're a parent of older children, I would even qualify it with that. Because when they're little, you still kind of think that, you know, um, I, having older children, you know, I sometimes just um, envy, not in a sinful way, but maybe, maybe it is, I don't know, but I'll look at these young mamas whose hopes and dreams haven't been dashed yet. <laughs> it gets harder the older they get. By the reality of older children. Yeah. Because you can't think. Because you still think that they're going to turn out perfect. <laughs> so, on that depressing note. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm talking so much. No, no. Um, and I think if we hold out to our older kids that they really do have freedom right. and give that to them and that autonomy, if we let go of it before they do right. and we don't get into a tug of war, I don't know. I just feel like that's the kind of little edge because we don't have anything else. No. 
No, I think they people are, lose control they when they're about four. Well, honestly, they come <laughs> back when they have children. Yeah, and they yeah. start finding that responsibility. Yeah, and by the way, I, I, I have, I have good kids. Oh yeah, I did too. They're not perfect right. though. <laughs> <laughs> they are not perfect. So, um, and it's so funny. I, I, this is so true that before you have babies, I can remember being in the grocery store and I would see this mother dealing with this toddler in the checkout line who wanted candy. And they would be screaming and crying and everything. And what did I say? My kids, my children will never do that. My kids will never do that. Well, I'm never doing that to my kids. Right, and guess what? They did it. <laughs> so you do get wise that you, you don't ever say they won't ever do that. So let's finish up really quick, and um, we're almost done. He says, verse 6, knowing this, that our old self, I love it. I can't now get the image of the pig out of my head. <laughs> that that old self, and by the way, that word old is not archaic, which we get archaic and all of those words. It's not a time word. It's literally, it's paleos, which means completely useless. Like old, filthy garment is the type of word it is. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified, put to death with him, that our body of sin, this Everything that we live with, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our lusts, our desires, our temperaments, our disposition, all of those things might be done away with, meaning that it can be rendered inoperative. With that, we should, now, now I love that, two little words, he says, with that, we are no longer slaves to sin. If you get the reality that you do not have to do that thing that you think you have to do, do you see how you're basically cutting the head off the snake? You're basically saying, I don't have to sin. And by saying that you don't have to sin, you give yourself, he says, with that, we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died, meaning us, is freed from the power, I would put there, of sin. Not the presence. People are still going to sin against you. You're still going to have sin in your life. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And he goes on there to even say, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Such an important truth that some even faiths get wrong, that Jesus died once for all. He is not dying on a continual basis. You, he is not dying every time you take communion. He died once for all. Because if he didn't, that would mean that we have to just continually, we have died to the power of sin in our lives. Now, if we give into that, we're giving into something we don't have to. There is not this big war that, ha that you have no control over. And, you're, and I'm telling you, people see their lives like that. That they have this big war going on in them. They don't really have the little bit of willpower that they have is to try to direct themselves in the right direction. That is completely incorrect thinking. We are a new creation. Yes, we can. And there's a bunch of places where he says, put on the new man, put on Christ. We put him on, we put him on. We put him on in that courtroom when we're justified and we're putting him on every single day. Now, every once in a while, like Kate said, I decide I want a different pair of shoes on that day. And I'll put that pair of shoes on and I may keep them on for a while. I've put on something that God doesn't intend for me to put on. Does that make sense? And I can even put that on, but my identity is that 
those shoes do not belong on my feet. And they should be uncomfortable enough and um, I should be tripping on them because they, they should make me uncomfortable. And that's how you know those shoes don't belong to you, right? Or that scarf or that bracelet or whatever you want to put on. By the way, in my mind, that's sin, all those things that you're putting on. But your existence, your reality is that you've put on Christ. Sarah? Yes. And that's what Paul speaks about in Ephesians 6 of the armor of God. Absolutely. So the shoes are really stick to me because I love shoes and I'm always putting on different shoes, but I always have to say to myself, putting on the shoes that lead to the path to peace. Absolutely. Like, is that the direction that they're going to take yeah. me that day? I have to literally like say that to myself and put, put each piece on every morning and like throughout the day because I see myself throwing throwing them off and changing yeah shoes absolutely and. it's that in fact you could do a whole fun study on the putting on there's lots of put-ons Paul loves that expression mm -hmm. and that's what we do get choice on by the way when we're sitting there we do get to decide you know if we want to add some accessories that maybe God doesn't want us to have does that make sense? And he says, for the death he died, he died once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Even so, because of all that I just said, we need to occupy our minds. We need to be calculating ourselves as dead to sin, but alive to God. That needs to be the occupation of our brains. So... Zoom, folks, you got anything you want to add? I'm sorry I didn't ask you to the very end. Molly's going to come and unmute you. You're good? Everybody good? Awesome. All right, let me close us. And um, I didn't even get to the last slide that talks about the death of a believer. You didn't have a chance to do all your homework. This is a really great, like, little, if you, if you don't have time to do all of your homework, which I totally get. When you get to this slide right here, this is a good one just for you to read later today, maybe, to look at the death of a believer. And what does that mean? And these are all the cross-references that talk about what have we died to. And I love Colossians 3.3 3 that says, You have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And if you, man, if you took every place that says in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, and that's how we are in Christ. We have been placed in him. He in us beautiful that basically that Holy Spirit when we put on those shoes or we put on that accessory that doesn't belong on us that Holy Spirit if we listen tells us so let's pray God I thank you for the fact that your salvation is completely life-changing it's not something that we could just compartmentalize. It's not something we can just do on Sunday. But God, literally, you transform our lives. We literally go from a pig to an entirely different animal, an entirely different creation. And I thank you for that. I thank you that... Um, sheep are dumb and sometimes God we are not the brightest as we yield ourselves we put ourselves in compromising positions that allow sin to come into our lives and God I just pray that as we looked at this lesson that we would consider those things and calculate those things think deeply about that we are alive to God and that we would look for those areas in our lives that we are yielding ourselves to things that do not belong in our lives. God, I pray that that sanctification work would be done in each one of our lives. 
and we thank you praise Jesus for one day we'll be removed from the presence of this sin and we'll live forever with you and I just thank you for that and for that homecoming day in Jesus name I pray amen, amen.